the actual way to practice exchanging self and others. Lama Tsongkhapa provided specific instructions on how to practice exchanging itself and others. Due to our strong attachment and care for ourselves, we have been continuously generating various sufferings from beginningless time until today. Self-cherishing is one of their fundamental afflictions. It means loving the I we falsely grasp. We strongly cling to the existence of I and then become attached to mine. Self-cherishing has a specific object, namely the five aggregates, especially the body and feelings. When it comes to the actual way to do this practice, first we need to recognize that due to strong attachment to self, Self-grasping becomes the driving force in the lives of ordinary beings. They undergo cycles of birth and death based on this self-attachment, continuously generating various sufferings from beginningless time until today. It is hard for ordinary beings to vanquish self-grasping. First, we should intellectually recognize that self-grasping is merely an attachment and a misconception that can be eliminated through practice. Similarly, the related afflictions such as self-cherishing and self-importance can also be eradicated through appropriate antidotes. After uprooting self-grasping, the continuum of your mind will not cease. Some people who don't believe in samsara think it doesn't exist. Recently, I met a childhood classmate in Jingdijin who is the same age as me. He is a professor at Jingdijin Ceramic University. He is intelligent, but he doesn't believe in samsara and thinks it doesn't exist. I told him, initially, we teach students that samsara exists, because, at that stage, it is difficult to explain non-self to them. However, when they start learning the principle of non-self, we will tell them that upon realizing non-self, samsara will disappear. When the attachment to I, the subject of cyclic existence, is uprooted, who is there to undergo reincarnation? The attachment to self can be removed through practice. Once it is uprooted, there is no more samsara. However, even though there is no more samsara, the mind's continuum still exists because the mind still undergoes birth and death. There is another layer of birth and death called transformative birth and death. Even though one no longer undergoes reincarnation in samsara, one's mind still experiences birth and death. In other words, one still has subtle attachment, namely the attachment to self in phenomenon and cognitive obscurations. Hence, one still undergoes transformative birth and death. It is not the samsaric birth and death, but it is also a form of attachment, the attachment to self and phenomenon. After the attachment to self and phenomenon is removed, your mind will be free from attachments. When both the attachment to self and phenomenon and cognitive obscurations are eradicated, your mind can manifest infinite wondrous effects and you will become one with the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. When you are free from attachment to self and phenomena, your mind can pervade the entire Dharma realm and manifest limitless wondrous uses. Why do we manifest infinite wondrous effects? Because we have generated the aspiration to benefit sentient beings. Hence, after attaining Buddhahood, we shall continue to guide and liberate sentient beings. However, at that time, we no longer have an attachment to the notion of self or sentient beings. 
Even though we have no attachment to sentient beings, we shall guide those who have a karmic connection with us throughout the universe according to the circumstances. Please bear this in mind. After attaining Buddhahood, you shall manifest in various forms according to the circumstances throughout the universe to benefit sentient beings who have a karmic connection with you. Attaining Buddhahood doesn't mean that you start resting as you haven't fully fulfilled the aspirations made in the past. However, at that time you will be free from afflictions, attachments, suffering and birth and death. Therefore, once we have a clear direction, our practice becomes easy. When facing afflictions, self-grasping, self-cherishing and various karmic habits, we won't be afraid because we know that attaining Buddhahood is our duty. We will attain Buddhahood in the future. You must have confidence in this. No matter how ingrained your afflictions and self-attachment are, as long as you gradually cultivate the right view, the energy you emit will be positive because all positive energy is based on the right knowledge and view. If your knowledge and view are not right, the energy you emit won't be positive. Therefore, right knowledge and view are fundamental. We seek our own happiness and prioritise our own interests. However, due to the lack of the right path, even after countless culpas, we cannot bring benefit to ourselves and others. Everyone wishes to live a good life. However, we often focus solely on our own benefit and fail to prioritise the well-being of others. Yesterday, we discussed how our happiness is connected with sentient beings. Only by bringing happiness to others can we attain true happiness. We often go against this principle. If we neglect the suffering and happiness of sentient beings and solely focus on our happiness, we will inevitably experience endless suffering. There is a causal relationship. Ordinary beings tend to think, others experience their suffering, and I experience my suffering. We have no connection. However, in reality, we are interconnected. If you only consider your well-being, interests and feelings, but disregard the feelings of others, over time you will become mentally ill. To attain happiness for yourself, you must first give and bring joy and benefit to others. By doing so, you will also attain happiness. This is a fundamental principle of life. Some extremely selfish individuals completely disregard the feelings of others. Those who only care about their own feelings are insane and selfish. Ordinary people can at least bring happiness to those around them, including their loved ones, and their loved ones can also bring joy to them. This is the fundamental principle of life. Most people understand some life principles and naturally act accordingly. Therefore, our happiness and suffering are interconnected and influence each other. Those who only consider their own well-being will become poor and miserable, while those who wholeheartedly serve others will experience happiness. This is happiness in the worldly sense. Due to lacking the right path, even after countless lifetimes of effort, one cannot bring true benefit and happiness to oneself and others. All you get is temporary worldly happiness because when you serve others, you actually do it for yourself and dedicate the merit to yourself. Although you may serve others, you prioritise yourself and place others in a secondary position. 
you haven't equalized yourself and others. Therefore, you cannot bring ultimate happiness to yourself and others. Not only do we fail to attain happiness, but we are also afflicted by suffering. Not only do we fail to bring genuine benefit to ourselves, but we have also generated countless afflictions and sufferings. This is the result of self-grasping and self-cherishing. Due to following the wrong path and direction, we cannot get what we pursue. Therefore, we must recognize the harm that self-attachment brings to our lives. We love ourselves the most. Due to self-grasping and self-cherishing, ordinary beings cannot attain a true happiness. If you love everyone as you love yourself, you will live happily and be reborn in a place like heaven. I have heard that people in the Nordic countries live like heavenly beings. They enjoy outdoor activities, value companionship, love others and are willing to help others. There are places like heaven on earth. Chinese people, however, suffer a lot. Nowadays, in China, there are few heavenly beings, but many azuras and hungry ghosts. There are too many hungry ghosts, though they may look like humans. They suffer a lot because they are greedy. Those who are very greedy are hungry ghosts. They only love themselves and completely disregard others. They are very selfish and indifferent to other humans and sentient beings. Such a place is complicated. Although everyone looks like a human, in reality there are beings from the six realms of samsara. Furthermore, there are also Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. There are heavenly beings, those who cultivate immortality and many hungry ghosts. Therefore, Buddhas and Buddhasattvas are guiding sentient beings here. After learning the Buddha's teachings, we should never be self-centered. Spiritual practice is about overcoming self-grasping, self-cherishing, and dedicating ourselves to benefiting others. Don't consider yourself important. Wherever you are, please devote yourself to serving sentient beings and take each step with mindfulness. If you dedicate yourself wholeheartedly, you will quickly accumulate merits and cultivate a qualified renunciation and thus be able to renounce worldly life swiftly. For those unwilling to contribute and lack sufficient merits, if they don't earnestly work for the benefit of sentient beings, the causes and conditions for becoming a monastic won't ripen. If one hasn't developed a qualified bodhicitta, one may become impatient and eagerly wish to renounce worldly life. They focus on liberating themselves and have ingrained Hinayana habits. Those with Hinayana habits tend to think about attaining individual liberation but don't focus on sentient beings and their suffering. Conversely, those who have generated bodhicitta engage in spiritual practice to liberate sentient beings from suffering. With the strong power generated by this motivation, we won't slack off. Upon thinking of the suffering of sentient beings, we won't slacken our efforts. We will make persistent efforts to uproot self-attachment and serve sentient beings. Many people have been here for seven or eight years. However, when interacting with them, I can still clearly sense their strong ego. Their thoughts are all around me, my family, my children. Some monastics may think about my practice, my precepts, my appearance as a practitioner, and so on. They are still very self-centered, thinking about themselves most of the time, such as, how can I cultivate spiritual powers, and when will I develop wisdom? 
How can you develop wisdom if you are attached to I? When wisdom arises, you will be selfless. When you are selfless, wisdom will arise. If you always ponder, when will I develop wisdom, you will never attain wisdom. How can you develop wisdom if you always think about I? If you ponder when you will attain wisdom based on a self-centered mind, you will never attain it. You will be influenced by demons. Conversely, if you truly let go of the attachment to I, you will devote yourself to benefiting sentient beings. Whatever I assign you, you will do it selflessly and earnestly. Some people regard even a little effort to help others as a waste of time that could be spent on their spiritual practice. They believe that working for the benefit of sentient beings obstructs their spiritual practice. Despite following me for many years, they still complain to others, you lead me into a pit of fire, implying that encouraging them to benefit sentient beings is akin to leading them into a dangerous situation. They feel that serving others hinders their spiritual practice. When faced with the choice to benefit themselves or others, they choose to benefit themselves. So, have you generated Buddhacitta? Those who have generated Buddhacitta would not make such a choice. Instead, they would prioritize benefiting others over themselves. They believe benefiting themselves and benefiting others are equal. Even when we meditate or listen to the Dharma for our own benefit, we intend to help others better. To benefit others, we benefit ourselves. When we attend to our own needs, such as eating, dressing and resting, it is to serve others better. When we meditate or listen to the Dharma, we too intend to benefit others better. At this stage, the seed of Buddhacitta begins to sprout in us. When sentient beings are in need, we can temporarily set aside our own tasks. We are willing to endure any hardship as long as it benefits others. We should have such determination. It is not easy to let go of self. If you primarily think about benefiting yourself during meditation and spiritual practice, it indicates you have forgotten Buddhacitta. Despite studying for many years, some individuals are still attached to their own well-being and have deeply ingrained self-grasping. They don't know that self-grasping is merely a wrong attachment. There is no I, no real self. You perceive the five aggregates as I, but they are not. The five aggregates are merely a tool created by our true nature. Our true nature, too, is not the I. Does the Buddha nature contain an I? No, it doesn't. So what do you cling to? You still cling to I. How pitiful you are. You have been studying with me for many years, yet you are still reluctant to take responsibility. You are still controlled by your I, self-cherishing and self-grasping. Whenever you make a small contribution to others, you consider it a loss and an impediment to your spiritual practice. Such people haven't generated Buddhacitta. After generating Buddhacitta, we should be courageous to take on the responsibility of the Buddha's mission. Everyone should be brave to undertake this responsibility. When you are willing to shoulder the Buddha's mission, it indicates that you have truly generated Buddhacitta. Those who genuinely generate Buddhacitta will think, I aspire to undertake the Buddha's mission and devote myself to benefiting others. At that point, 
benefiting oneself is also benefiting others because there is no longer a sense of self. Sentient beings are still ignorant and unaware of the truth of non-self. We should help them cultivate the wisdom of non-self. Once you are selfless, you will realize that sentient beings are still attached to the notion of self. You will feel compassion for them. Therefore, we need to help them uproot self-grasping. This is what it means to benefit others. Benefiting others means helping them eliminate self-grasping, not providing them with worldly comforts such as food and drink. It is about guiding them to develop wisdom. After they have received the teachings, they can practice on their own. When they realize non-self, they can help more sentient beings. Therefore, we shall first uproot our self-grasping and then guide sentient beings to do the same. This is our most important mission. Sentient beings still have self-grasping, which causes them to go against the truth. Our most important task is to help sentient beings eliminate self-grasping. We have understood the principle of non-self, but sentient beings are still unaware and trapped in the cycle of samsara, clinging to the notion of self. Sometimes you cannot resonate with me. When I stay with you, I can sense your self-grasping. That is why sometimes I cannot impart teachings to you. Nowadays, I no longer receive visitors. Why is that? Because your self-attachment remains strong when you visit me. In such circumstances, what is the point of meeting you? Please listen to the teachings. When you are selfless, you can visit me and exchange yourself with me. In fact, every time you visit me, I will first swap myself and you, checking your progress in spiritual practice. However, I have noticed that your self-grasping is still ingrained. What should I do? I am no longer willing to receive visitors. Even though I have taught you for so long, your self-attachment remains firm. Alas, I don't want to spend time meeting you anymore. What's the point of meeting you? You keep talking about I, your trivial matters, all about I. You haven't even opened your mind, so how dare you visit your spiritual teacher? You are not qualified to visit me. How do you have the confidence to meet me? You don't realize how poor your spiritual level is and lack a sense of shame. That's why I don't want to see you. Those with a sense of shame are aware that they are not eligible to visit me. They are truly dedicated to their practice and realize they are still unqualified. Hence, they are diligently practicing. Such practitioners are good. At least they recognize that they are not qualified to visit me.